Welcome to the On Labs podcast. This is Bill Kennedy, and our special guest for round two is Steve Hoffman. Steve, thanks for coming back. My pleasure. All right. So, Steve, remember now, we've got an hour to cover the next 30 years of your life, which I think is going to be quite impossible, but we're going we're gonna to try to make that happen today. When we were last talking to you on the last show, I think we ended around 1994 when we were talking about how you sold. You started, you built, you went back to that game from high school. You rebuilt it in Visual Basic. You started selling it again on those bulletin boards. That led to a gaming company needing that game, which your game ended up outperforming theirs at the end of the day. And you now have, I guess, an official gaming company at this point in 94, which you always wanted from the beginning, right? So I achieved my dream. I had my gaming company. It was called Lava Mind. And we had launched our first title, Gazillionaire. And we were on our way to becoming gazillionaires. But <laughs> still, we still had a long way to go. Uh, after that, uh, we decided to launch a game called Zapitalism which is capitalism with a Z. Um, and it's another business simulation game all about how you manage a retail store. And then that game we launched, we got another publisher, a big publisher at the time called Accolade. We got, again, an amazing deal where we kept all the rights and we put that game out there and it also did extremely well. So we had two games under our belt and then we went to complete the trilogy. So I had this vision that we would have a trilogy of games, Gazillionaire, Zapitalism, and then the final one, Profitania. So Profitania was where you actually run factories and manufacture the goods. So it took it all the way from, we went backwards, but it took it all the way from making the goods to selling the goods to intergalactically trading the goods. Um, and each game had a different, entirely different world. They weren't set in the same world. So one was set in a bizarre kind of LSD inspired outer space. That's gazillionaire. Zapitalism was on this weird uh, archipelago planet where you would have, uh, where you'd run retail stores on the main island of Zapanalia. And then Profitania took place underground in an underground kingdom where you would manufacture these goods based on geothermal power. Um, and the games each had very different uh, gameplay mechanics. So we launched those games. Uh, we did very well. And then my friend from film school, my best friend, uh, Tracy Fullerton, came to me and she uh, said, let's start a company together. <laughs> <laughs> so we, she, was, she was working in New York for this big ad agency called RGA doing interactive projects and they had just completed one for Microsoft, this online game, brilliant game called Netwits. And this was in the early days of online gaming. So people hadn't done uh, a lot of online gaming at all. There was EverQuest was out there, but this was kind of the first big casual online game. So kind of pioneering a whole new space for interactive casual play. And she and the engineer, they had the rights to the whole engine that powered this, the massively multiplayer online engine, which in those times was cutting edge technology. What year are we talking at this point? Because you already have a successful company. I imagine you've got, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 employees. At the, like, you must have had a serious operation to put three games out. And like, what year are we talking about? So we are talking 1998. 1998 is when we began. So uh, we did uh, Lava Mine for four years. We had a lot of titles, but all, you know, our team was pretty darn small. It wasn't 20 or 30 people. It was two core people and uh, a, a, a few contractors. And we just cranked, you know, when, wow. when you are an indie developer, you just do whatever it takes. So, you know, I was doing all the coding. I was doing, you know, a lot of the artwork. My, my partner was doing the artwork. It, um, and then we hired some freelance artists, some freelance sound people, and we just put out those games one after another. That's what we did. Heads down. And you're working, you're working out of your garage. I mean, your, your costs at this point are fairly low, right? I mean, you've got low cost, high margin. Yeah. See, we had, we had no permanent staff. We had uh, no uh, office space. We, there was no WeWork. 
<laughs> thank goodness we were working out of our house. Now you have a multiplayer engine game, which I imagine is written in C. Like, are you still working in VB for this multiplayer game? No, those days are gone. So, uh, and my coding days are, are winding, winding up. So at the end of Lava Mind, I basically stopped coding. You know, once I couldn't do <laughs> what we needed to do in Visual Basic, I was sort of out of commission. So I moved more into the design and business development role. And as my partner, you know, one of my partners, he was the master coder. So he had developed the whole platform um, with a team and done that. And, um, but actually had done most of it himself. And we, uh, there were four of us that joined together uh, to start a company. And we had, um, my friend Tracy had this expression that she liked to use. And she liked to say, let's start spider dancing. And spider dancing was when you come up with an idea, you get so excited about that idea that you start dancing around and waving <laughs> your hands in the air and going, oh my God, we could actually do this. <laughs> you know, wow. like a spiders. And then you start spinning a web. So we, we, we started spider dancing together of like, what could we do with this massively multiplayer engine? We, we had no idea. Could we make, should we make games? We had a very small team for people. Um, how could we compete? Could we do something new? And I had the idea, well, let's not make a single game because we don't know if a game will be a hit or a miss. Like gaming's tough, like it's entertainment. You know, you have a hit, you have a miss. You know, I got lucky with Lava Mine, but we don't know. Why don't we build a platform and get all the other game developers who don't have this massively multiplayer engine on our platform? So that was my vision. She was more inclined, no, let's just make games. <laughs> and so she went off uh, and, and they, they were working on the engine, you know, getting it up to speed and getting everything set up. And I went out and started talking to all these developers, all these game developers, trying to convince them, you know, before we even had the platform that they needed our platform. So I was basically doing the lean startup method before the lean startup method existed. So let me, let me, let me interrupt you here. I have a few questions. Because we're talking about 98 here. Were you at all worried or hesitant to get out of a technical role at that point? Or were you kind of happy to move into this more of a, which it sounds like more of a developer relationship kind of role that you're moving here? I was happy to be in this new role. It was a new challenge for me. And honestly, I hadn't kept up on my coding. I went, to, I went to college and studied more electrical engineering than I did computer science. So it wasn't up on C++ or any of the, the latest technology. So I really couldn't be a cutting edge coder. I could code those other games that I made in Visual Basic, but I would have to kind of go back and, and learn everything to do this. And I was more interested in the time at design because I had designed these three games, they had done well, and I really was interested in the, the concepts, uh, becoming a better and better designer, and also doing business development, going out there and you know, engaging, trying to build a real business. So let me, ask, let me ask you this next question then, because it's 98. How are you, what's your strategy to reach these developers, right? I mean, I guess the internet is starting now, you've got IRC, you've got channels. I guess we may even have conferences at this point. What's your strategy to reach the, the right developers to get them to use your platform? Reaching out to developers, I didn't have a clear strategy. All I knew is I needed to get to developers, but I didn't know a lot personally because we'd been in sort of our own little bubble. So I, but luckily I was in San Francisco and there were a lot of, a lot of game developers there. So I started to reach out to friends who'd connect me with friends, who'd connect me with other people. I'd go out to these, meetups at the time, they weren't called meetups, but these gatherings, and I would meet developers and one led to another, led to another, and I just hunted them down and I got in front of them and I pitched them what we had, what we were building, and then I listened carefully. So the key for me was really listening to what they needed and they needed a lot. <laughs> so first of all, they needed a lot. They wanted the system customized to their particular needs each of them. And they also uh, didn't want to give a lot. So they didn't want to give a, up a lot of revenue. They wanted to do a very small revenue share, yet they wanted a lot of customization. So the deeper I went with these developers, 
the more I began to understand that this would be really tough for us with our team. Like we had a small team, we had no capital. If we we're gonna to try to customize this platform for each of the person, you know, we're only gonna be able to take on a, a few people max and, and who knows if they'll even complete their games. So it's, would, it turned out to be even riskier for us to take that path at this time than for us to just do something ourselves. That was the conclusion I came to. And it was a tough conclusion because, you know, I saw the potential of a platform. I'd much rather build a platform than a product. I think platforms have a far more potential in most cases to get all the work of other people. But at the time, most game developers were kind of independent spirits. They, most of them wanted to build it themselves. And if they couldn't get somebody to like do everything they wanted, they would just say, forget it. I'll just, I either won't use it or I'll go and build one myself. So it was the early days of gaming. Uh, people didn't always see the value of, of online at that time because we were sort of ahead of the curve. Most of the games were not online, 99%. So we decided to go back and, and uh, to uh, the gaming model and build our own game. So how long are you in this particular gaming company? Like now it's like 98. Are you there for 10 years? Are you there for five years? Did you have success just building games? How do you get out of this to that next step? It's a, it's a crazy story. So the next thing we did with this gaming company was we actually um, built our first game and we decided to focus on casual gaming because nobody was really doing that. And we decided to take a very unique approach. So we built one of the first JavaScript widgets for gaming and that would plug into literally any website. So we could go out there. It was the very early days of the web. You know, uh, Netscape was just launching. Everything was brand new, uh, very exciting. So we went out to all these developers and we said, plug Jabber Chat into your site. Not only is it a game, but it's a game that you play while chatting. So these are chat-based games and we designed these, all of us designed these, and they were very creative games where you could play them. I've never seen anything like them even today, where you could play as you chat with people, literally word games and other games that you play as you just have a conversation. So they were chat-based games and then it just took off. All these websites, you know, you know, over a hundred sites just agreed to plug in our widget and put it up there and we were like, wow, we're onto something. And then we submitted our uh, Jabber Chat to South by Southwest, the big conference, and under the interactive category. And we won. We won best interactive game uh, in, at South by Southwest. So we were on top of the world, but we had a problem. We didn't have much money. <laughs> no. And we were spending all of our money on this um, and we, we didn't have revenue. So we were like, how do we monetize this? It's the early days of the internet. We got to make some money. You know, people aren't going to pay for these chat based games. How do we do it? We decided advertising. That was the logical way to monetize them. So there was this ad company uh, that doesn't exist anymore. It was the very early days and they uh, gave us uh, the code so that we could start showing banner ads in our games. So we designed them uh, for banner ads. So everybody put one up, all, hundreds of sites would have these little ads showing in the game. And then we waited. We had a lot of traffic and we were waiting and we waited. And at the end of the month, we got our first check. And you know how much it was? It was enough to buy a pizza. <laughs> so we were, we were like, oh my God, an entire month's revenue and we can like buy a pizza and split it four ways. Were you worried at all at the time that people were gonna see this as um, annoying and then stop using your product? Or you were just looking at it as we need revenue and we'll see what happens. For us, uh, putting in the ads was an absolute necessity because we needed to monetize this. We had no venture funding. We didn't know venture capitalists. We had no way of getting money. We were just doing this on our own. And we made the ads not annoying. They were, they were literally banner ads that appeared in the product like you would see uh, today. Uh, but they didn't pop, there weren't pop-ups or other things. So it, you could just use, it, it was, we made it very elegant. So it wasn't annoying. We weren't worried about that. Um, it didn't seem to have any effect on our growth. However, the thing that had the effect was no money coming in. <laughs> that hit the bottom line. So we were, we were just like, what do we do? How long can it we It didn't go? work. You know, we can't, we don't know. Maybe advertising, you know, will take a long time to develop on 
the internet. In those days, people just weren't paying much for ads. There was no ad market, right? They were paying like a pittance for ads. So it just wasn't developed. We were too early. So we started to look around and we found out through the grapevine that MTV was actually looking to launch their first interactive television show. And what they wanted was to synchronize a live TV broadcast with people online, playing online, massive, a massive number of people, like a, you, know, you know, hundreds of thousands of people online playing on their PCs in perfect timing with the show. So we said, that's an opportunity. MTV has money, they're Viacom, they can pay us. So we started calling uh, the senior vice president of MTV Interactive. We got his number <laughs> somehow. We got his number. We started calling and saying, hey, we're Spider Dance. We have the exact technology you need. Wow. You should come talk to us. And guess what happened? He never called. He never called back. <laughs> We didn't get a single call, like all the messages we left. We were just some annoying, crazy freaks out there. And in those days, big companies didn't turn to startups that much. It, the startup thing wasn't a thing then. Like if you were a startup, people, especially huge corporations who were going out there to television, they wanted the biggest company as possible to be servicing them. They did not want a startup. <laughs> Startups were highly risky and highly suspect. So um, my partner though, Tracy got invited to speak at CES, the big conference, you know, around uh, computers and entertainment um, in Las Vegas. So she went to Las Vegas and we did what all good entrepreneurs do. We were talking to everybody like we had the product, even though we hadn't developed, like we just had this like Jabber Chat gaming engine and we hadn't developed the whole TV portion, but we figured we could figure that out. Like that's what we were there to do was figure it out. So she went there. She got invited on a panel and on this panel, she just starts talking about what we're doing and how we're going to synchronize television with uh, online entertainment. And it's going to be a whole new thing. You know, nobody had done this before. We were going to do it. And it was spider dance. She gives her talk <laughs> after she's done with her talk. You know, this guy comes running out of the audience, run and pushes his way right up to her. And he goes, he goes, I need to talk to you. She goes, sure. And she goes, I am the senior vice president of MTV and we need your product. <laughs> and she goes, oh my God. I know <laughs> we've been leaving you voicemails. <laughs> we've been trying to get through to you. <laughs> and literally uh, we moved fast. We, we didn't even have time to fly to New York. We cut the deal like over the phone because we didn't have money to like do all this traveling and stuff. So we cut the deal. But that's a risk, Steve. You cut a deal for tech you said you had that you didn't have and now you had to build it. So we didn't actually say we had it. We said we are building it. So we were technically correct. Like we were in the process of building it. And when we cut the deal, we uh, uh, made sure to give us time to build it. They knew, like they knew what we had and they knew what, but they knew that we were confident we could build it. That's what they knew, that, that we were confident we could do it. And they had nobody else that was confident they could do it. What was your time frame now? Six months? Nine months. So we gave ourselves nine months. We had to have nine months because right. literally, uh, you know, it, we knew there was a lot of work. We basically uh, hunkered down we took the money they gave us, like 350K, which for us was a lot of money at the time. It's a lot of money. And we uh, hired up a couple more engineers and we just went to work. We just like crazy, you know, we hired an artist and we just started building and we, all the technical difficulties, all, this, all the different things we had to do, we started to work on. And ac actually, I think I made a mistake on the timing. <laughs> I think it, nine months was how long uh, we when we launched the product we were nine months old so we had been in business three months and it was another six months for us to build the product so it was a tight time frame let me ask you a quick question because tracy gets on stage and and all of this happens right i mean she had to have been planning to be on stage for months so i mean your goal was to just reach out to developers and you just caught this big fish right at the end of the day, all because she was at this conference. Like, what are your thoughts about that? That's, is that just life? Is that surreal? Is that you know, you, <laughs> meant to be? My philosophy of life, there's so many unknowns out there that you cannot uh, possibly take all those variables into account when you're planning. So you just have to go, you just have to go. Like, you just have to go, go, go in whatever direction you want to, you know, you think you need to go 
to get the results you want. And then you'll see what happens. So she accepted to talk at this conference, not, you know, earlier, not really just because it was an opportunity to get in front of people and to, and to maybe do some business development. We didn't know what would come of it at the time. It wasn't planned. It was all like serendipitous that he even happened to be in the audience. I mean, we had no idea. So yes, came out of the blue. Yeah. What I love about your story up to this point is it's always you saying, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to go reach out to that person. I'm going to find the person to talk to, even if they don't talk to me back. At least I know that I tried. Like at this point, it's like you have no, you're not sitting in your seat going, I wonder if, I wonder if, I wonder if. It was just like, they didn't talk to me, but I tried. Here I am, right? Like this is the theme I'm getting throughout this entire story. And then the people around you are doing the same thing. It's our feeling that we have nothing to lose. We should dream as big as we want to dream. We'll go out there, we'll do everything to make it happen, and it will, something will happen. <laughs> it might not be what we dreamed, but there may be some other thing that comes along that, that is even bigger than we thought. So yet yeah, just being out there in the world doing stuff um, with a, 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 a flexible vision of where you could go, where you could take it. And we knew we wanted to be at the intersection of kind of entertain. I knew I wanted to be at the intersection of entertainment and technology. So did my partners. That was what we knew. And then we, we thrust ourselves out there and there are a lot of opportunities because things are developing. We are at the right time. You know, we, when I launched Gazillionaire, they called it the multimedia revolution. Like that was the, the term. Now we are on to the internet revolution and uh, we are taking advantage of, e of those technologies each step of the way. So let me ask you this now. I'm going to push the timeline a little bit. Were you successful with MTV? Did you get that product launched? And then where, what happens after that? That is another crazy story. We uh, signed our deal with MTV. We had six months to get this product live. And MTV and Viacom in general was extremely concerned. Their reputation was on the line. They took a huge risk working with this unknown startup in a day when big corporations didn't work with startups on a product that was gonna go live in front of their entire audience. And if it failed, they would look, they would look horrible. They would, they would, you know, it would have cost the senior vice president his job and a lot of other people their jobs. And it would have just made MTV kind of a laughing stock. Steve, which is why I've always heard nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM. <laughs> yeah, nobody ever got fired for hiring <laughs> IBM. Uh, but they could get fired for hired. They could get fired for hiring Spider Dance, this crazy <laughs> company with a crazy name. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely, they definitely could get fired. So they they were on. The closer we got to that deadline, the the more anxious the MTV side became. And anxiety is infectious. So we were like getting more anxious <laughs> because they were anxious. And we also, it was a really tight deadline. So we're trying to figure out how to use Chiron machines to put content in real time from uh, our servers back into the TV broadcast. So like the winners and the top scores and everything could be on TV for everybody watching as it's online. We had to figure out how to synchronize. We were using at the time Macromedia Director, which uh, Macromedia became Adobe. Um, we're using their product to actually run our show. Um, it, so there are all these new technologies that we hadn't been using before that we are trying to figure out how to put them together. And we were getting closer and closer and closer. And the other thing, they didn't have AWS. They didn't have cloud. We had to put all the, no. we had to basically build out all the hardware for this at the same time, all the servers in, in, in some New Jersey co-location facility where we got a T1 line. Um, we had to set up everything and pray it worked. The other thing, there was no testing software out there to test these loads. Like we had to kind of hack our own testing software. We didn't know if we could take what MTV threw at us. Like we had never had that many users. No, and you couldn't, and you couldn't simulate it. And T1 isn't really a lot of bandwidth and you're dealing with brand new tech that is absolutely not mature. We had, and we had a tiny team, three engineers, one artist, you know, <laughs> you know, designers, you know, we had just like a tiny team of under 10 people uh, trying to do all of this. 
um, in this compressed time under this pressure cooker of MTV, you know, looking over our shoulder every step of the way, paranoid that they made a huge mistake signing us up. <laughs> like they... So was everybody working weekends? Was everybody working like 60 hours a week? I can't imagine anybody went home. Some of that 350,000 had to go to food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All of us were working all the time, but all of us went home because all of us worked out of our homes. We couldn't afford an office. Every penny we had was going into buying the servers, setting up the co-location facility, hiring artists, sound designers, you know, everything we needed to actually make this a, you know, a world-class product. So we had no office. Like uh, we were just working out of our houses. Our engineering team was on the East Coast in New Jersey. Our design team and business team was on the West Coast in San Francisco and LA. And we were all spread out and <laughs> just doing. So you're figuring out remote back in 99, 2000. You're figuring out how to do remote dev without the internet really giving the tools that we have today as well. And this is mind blowing. Nobody had Slack or any of the tools we have today to do remote development, but we were doing that too. So we had to figure that out and make it work. We were on the phone all the time trying to, you know, coordinate things. And we just had to do it. When you have to do something, you, and, and if you have a really good team, you figure out a way to do it. And we were just hunkered down, going full force, getting closer and closer and closer to the deadline. At the same time, uh, we needed to raise more money because we knew we barely had enough money to launch this product. And literally, to even keep the servers running, we needed more cash than we had been given. So at the same time we were doing all of that, we, my partner and I, were trying to raise capital. <laughs> and we, we didn't know any investors. Like at that time, there were no incubators. There were, we had no network. I was nobody, you know? I was just an indie game developer at the time. So I had no network. Um, so I was running, uh, luckily I was in San Francisco. So we were just running around, my partner and I, in, between San Francisco and LA, trying to find somebody to raise capital. We had this one angel investor who said he loved us, but he never would invest. He kept, he, he, he would actually suck up a huge amount of our time. He'd keep asking for stuff like, can you show me this? Can you show me that? Can you do this revenue graph? Can you do that? And we were like, we had an 80 page business plan that we wrote up. None of it would appease this angel investor. He wouldn't, he, he just kept hedging. And we just, we didn't know what to do. We knew a few venture capitalists, but we didn't know many. Finally, we got a break. We got an introduction to, of all people, this big Hollywood guy who'd come out of Universal Studios and formed his own venture fund. And he had brought in big shots. Like at the time, these were like really big names. He had brought in the, the, the founder of Sega. He had brought in the, uh, well, the former CEO of Sega. He had brought in Michael Milken, um, the bond, junk bond king, all these like crazy people into his company. So they were the big thing at the time in Hollywood. And we pitched them and they said, yes, they want to do a deal with us. So we were like, all right, give us the money. And you know what happened? They didn't give us the money. They were like, well, we don't know if you can deliver. See, this is pre startups. Most, you know, startups weren't, you know, were just starting, right? And these guys were Hollywood guys and they were going to hedge their bet. They didn't know if the technology worked or if we were bullshitting them. And they go, no, no, no. We'll negotiate. They negotiated everything with us. So we actually had to go to a law firm and run up 60K in legal bills trying to negotiate this deal. We got it all negotiated with them and they said, let's wait until the product launches. As soon as a product launches, if it's successful, we will write you the check. If it's not successful, you're on your own. <laughs> so we're like, well, this is the deal we got. <laughs> Everything's hanging on this product launch. Our entire company, our funding, literally we have debts, everything we, you know, our reputation. If this product doesn't work, we are dead. <laughs> so we come up to the day when we are going to launch our product. And the, you know, the, the minutes were going everything at the last minute. It's about to go live on national television. And we, you know, and MTV uh, did a huge, huge uh, pre-publicity for this. They were having commercials on MTV every day showing, uh, showing, you know, Web Riot. It was called Web Riot with Ahmed Zappa, Frank Zappa's son, a music trivia game live that any of you can play from home. 
<laughs> and we actually had our name Spider Dance. We negotiated into the deal where, where Spider Dance would appear on national television. So we were like so happy, you know, that we had done this amazing thing. And we, we put it out there. And um, so lots of people were expecting this launch date. Like lots of people were get, getting ready to try out what is this Web Riot thing um, brought to you by Spider Dance? What is it? So it, we went there, we launched. Um, the minute counted down and then it went live and we were looking at our servers and we were waiting and everybody started to come in and it's, you know, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of users started to join simultaneously to play this interacting. And then all of a sudden in the first three minutes, our servers went down. Oh my God. We crashed. I was on the phone to our lead engineer. And he was like, oh, they're down. The servers are down. And the, 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 I hung up with him. MTV's on the line. The senior vice president is cursing, <laughs> screaming. How could this go down? I was like, give us a minute. Give us a minute. We will figure this out. We will figure this out. <laughs> we're going to get this back up. Um, we were scrambling. It turned out that there was a hacker out there who had done a denial of service attack on us. Oh man, are you kidding me? We weren't prepared for this sort of uh, somebody hacking us, let alone just getting the system up and running. These are the early days. So this denial of service attack was bombarding us. Our engineers were going nuts, trying to figure out where it was coming from. Could they block those IP addresses? Boom, two minutes later, they did it. They blocked the IP addresses and we were back up. And then it ran flawlessly like flawlessly wow. like the whole thing went off in the on air everything you know taking the the winners and putting them on screen live all of that ran flawlessly we had done it we were oh my god we collapsed on the floor we were so happy but we had a problem we had no money like we're a startup we have no money like we need money so i go back to our in our investors uh, who had committed, who I, we had done, crossed every T, dotted every I on that contract, spent a huge amount of time and money. They were gonna write us the check for $5 million at a 20 million, at a 15 million pre-money valuation, 20 post. And in those days, that was incredibly good deal. Like it was a good deal. Like we had negotiated a good deal. So they, uh, we came to them, okay, send us a check. We're done. We're ready to go. You know what they said? No. <laughs> they said, we will send you the check, but we've been thinking, you are overvalued. And we decided we are going to cut your valuation in half. And we, so if you can accept that, you will get our money. And we were like, what the blank are you talking yeah, exactly. about? We had totally agreed on valuation. You'd never said anything about this before. And now that you know, we are desperately needed your money and have been waiting, you're going to squeeze us. <laughs> and you're going to squeeze us, you Hollywood bastards. <laughs> and you know, we said, screw you, we're walking. We will not take your $5 million at half the valuation because if you do this test now, what are you going to do next? And we don't want to be in bed with you. So we said that and then we regretted it <laughs> because <laughs> we had given them the bird and now we were left holding the bag, <laughs> which was like the house was crumbling. That, the problem was it was not only bad timing that we were out of money, it was bad timing in that it was right before Christmas. And at Christmas, all the venture capitalists go away. They just go away and they don't come back uh, until you know, until the new year, um, kind of in mid-February, that's when they come back. So yeah. we had a month and a half where we had no money. <laughs> and nobody to talk to and no more business because you finished your contract with MTV. You know, I, I've always heard the saying, money's very expensive when you need it, right? Like, yes. this is kind of the situation you're in, right? You felt like it was too expensive with that devaluation. We were so, I mean, we hit a depression, right? Because we just couldn't do anything. And all of us had to, you know, we had to stop paying our engineers. We had to beg them to keep working because we barely had enough money to pay the hosting fees, which we didn't even know if we could pay. Um, we were, you know, nobody got paid. We were just uh, devastated. 
And then, you know, Christmas came, Christmas went, uh, CES started. Um, I was still out there hustling. So I was just like, we got to talk to more people. We got to talk to more people. So, you know, we're using Macromedia Director. I got to, I got to in touch with the president of Macromedia. Um, I went to pitch him for an investment. He said, you know what he turned to, he was just like, he looked at me and he said, well, you know, we're launching this new product called Flash. And if you switch and use Flash, we may be able to introduce you to some investors. And I'm like, can you use Flash? And I'm like, absolutely, we can use Flash. No problem, <laughs> we will use Flash, we will figure it out. Flash is our thing. <laughs> That's because Steve's on the engineering team. So yes, we can use Flash. <laughs> and then we went back to CES, where uh, basically a year ago we had been you know, funded and good shit, you know, and, and everything had gone well. We went back to CES. And at CES, we were got this super cheap hotel room, like the cheapest, grungiest hotel room in Vegas. Like that's all we could afford. It was awful. We I remember us laying on our beds in that hotel room, so depressed. <laughs> like, like, what are we doing? Um, my partner said she couldn't go on anymore. It's just too depressing. But we we're like, we have to go on. We have to. I get back uh, to the Bay Area. Um, after CS, the venture capitals are starting to come back, and I, you know, go to Macromedia. Introduce me, introduce me to somebody, and they go, "Well, we got our first meeting. It's with this big venture firm on Sand Hill Road, and they, the president of Macromedia, was going to go with me and hear my pitch in front of the venture capitalists, so that Macromedia could decide if they really wanted to pitch me to more ventures. Because remember, their reputation is on the line, so they want to hear how this venture capitalist reacts to my pitch. That just made me really nervous. Because I knew if I don't do a good convince this venture capitalist, maybe all the introductions will end. <laughs> like this will be the first and last introduction. So I go in there with Macromedia. I give my best pitch possible. I do not say uh, I am desperate for money. I do not say we are. <laughs> I learned my lesson. You do not reveal your hand to the other poker player, which in this case is the vulture capitalist. You keep your cards close to your vest. Um, and so I kept my cards like really close. I didn't reveal any of the, uh, you know, uh, that, that we were literally, we were probably gonna go out of business any day now. <laughs> I didn't reveal that. I pitched it like we got Fiacom, MTV, our show was a massive success, which it was. We are like on top of the world, did a great pitch. Um, and then, you know, and I also threw in, you know, you see the Macromedia is here backing us. They're gonna introduce me to more VCs. I finished my pitch, uh, the guy, has a completely stone-faced expression. Like, no, no way to read him. Like, he wasn't, he was like, excuse me, I have to go. Uh, please wait here. And he left. And we're just, I was like, oh my God, did I totally blow it? <laughs> like, this guy, you know, didn't give me anything. Um, and I, we're waiting there and I'm looking at the, the president of Macromedia. Well, this is what it is. And he comes back into the room uh, and he sets down a piece of paper and goes, here's your term sheet. I want to give you not $5 million at a 15 million pre, which we kept the same valuation. I want to give you $7 million. And I looked at him and I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> he is giving me wow. the term sheet on my first pitch. Like literally my first pitch, you know, yeah, I've done no due diligence, nothing. He's just there. And I figured out. He's, I was thinking fast. I was like, well, he's doing this because I'm here with Macromedia and I told him we're, they're going to introduce us to more venture capitalists. So he knows if he lets me out of this room, I may get funded by one of his competitors. So that fear, I put the fear actually into him to get him to move and not waste time doing diligence. So I suddenly realized, oh, I have a edge here, right? Um, I have this fear thing. So I was going to play it to the max because literally we didn't want to go through a long due diligence process. We didn't want to, those could take a month, two months, you know, and the venture capitalists can change their mind any time, like just decide not to invest. You've experienced that already, so. I already knew we could get burned. <laughs> he was like, will you accept this? And I looked down and my heart is saying, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we will accept with thank God. But my brain says, hold on. And I go, no. I said, five million, seven million is more than we asked for. We only need five, but I'll tell you what, 
we, this was me, I go, we can split the difference with you. And trust me, I would have been happy with seven. We can split the difference with you if you can guarantee that you will close this in two weeks. And he looked at me and said, done deal. Wow. Literally. Nice. Done deal. So what I got without showing weakness, because, you know, we needed the money like yesterday. <laughs> two weeks is still a long time for us. What I got was that money in our bank account right as fast as humanly possible, you know, which is without showing weakness, because if I showed weakness, we would get slaughtered like I had before. Like they, they'll just pick you, you pick your bones. So um, in this case, um, he, he lived up to his word, literally. He had the money in our bank like in two weeks. We had negotiated all the terms, which is really hard for a venture deal, and got the money in our bank, and we were back in action. <laughs> so we, we closed wow. like you know six million bucks, and then we got another six million in loans on top of that, debt financing, which was a really good deal. Got an incredible deal. So we got all this cash coming in. We're hiring up. We went to 20 engineers, a huge staff. We got this, we moved down to Hollywood, got this big office in Venice Beach. It was like amazing spite. And everybody knew us. And we were running around Hollywood having the time of our lives. We were closing deals right and left. You know, we closed deals with Warner Brother. We closed deals with NBC, Turner Broadcasting, Game Show Network, History Channel, you know, all of, you know, one after another. The dominoes are just falling at this point because everybody trusts. It was insane. We were on top of the world. Things were going so well. We were the number one in our sector in interactive television. Everybody knew us. Uh, a large public company came along and they said they want to buy us like they want to buy us. And we were I was like, oh, my God, you know, we should just sell because we kept a huge we'd only had a series A financing. We had a huge portion of the company. This would make us all, you know, very rich. Um, but our venture capitalists, you know, they they don't want to sell early like they see something that's on fire and they want to milk it for all it's worth. Right. They 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 want to keep it going. So. We were inclined to sell, but they, they said, no, let us handle this. So they went to negotiate with the company and they told them, no, you can't, they will not sell. <laughs> and this, you know, I was, I didn't really love that, but uh, I figured, well, we're doing well. Things are great. You know, we're on top of the world. We're the number one in our space. What could go wrong? You know, well, this is the world that we live in, right? It's not always like you imagined it should turn out to be. In fact, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. <laughs> so, wow. uh, another company moved into our space who had been in another space. They'd been in this kind of online lottery space and they had raised $60 million. So literally, uh, you know, 10x what we had raised. And, and they were out there and they were determined to... Uh, because they saw how successful we were, they were determined to crush us. So they were out there sp basically offering their products for free to all of our partners, right? So undercutting our revenue. And then at the same time, they would tell people, you can't trust Spider Dance. They don't have good servers like we do. They don't, you know, they're going to crash. But everything that, everything nasty you can think of that they could possibly say, Every lie that they could come up with, they would come up with. And we were constantly battling them. We were still winning deals. Like, they weren't winning deals. We were still, uh, they won one deal, but we won, you know, almost every other deal. But this was really made it tough. And then, um, so we had to spend a lot more money. We had to up our hosting. We had to spend far more capital. So we were running out of cash now. Because to compete with them who were outspending us, we had to spend more. And... All, and so we had gone from business that could potentially be profitable to one where we're now back in the red. Um, and we had this big debt payments coming up. So we were say, okay, we got to go raise money now. And then the perfect storm happened. And it was called the dot-com bubble. Burst! <laughs> it burst! <laughs> and everything, all these companies were going down right and left around us. And we were like... Oh my God. And we are going to the venture capital community now to raise our next round. And, and at the same time, all our customers were coming back to us because the bubble had burst, especially the media companies. And they were saying all their advertising revenue was plummeting. So literally at NBC, where we had our biggest show, The Weakest Link, the executives there said had to cut their staff from 250 people. And we went back into their office and they were three people, three people. And, and they turned to us, this third-party provider, for a, 
interactive TV show, which really had no way to monetize in those days. Like there was very little ad revenue for interactive at that time. And they turned to us and say, we're, you know, we're not going to pay you anything, but if you want to keep running everything on your own and you can, and you can sell the ads, then you can do that. And we were like, oh my God, our revenue has, you know, plummeted. So all our partners started cutting their contracts and our revenue started to go down as we tried to raise capital, as the market was collapsing, everything, it was a, a, a total nightmare. Um, but, uh, we, uh, we had been through nightmares before, so we were determined to keep going and we just kept cutting. We cut our staff, we cut, our, we cut this, we cut that, but we wanted to keep the shows on air. So we kept the shows on air. As we were cutting, we were doing some really innovative shows, like more innovative than just like, uh, we were doing James Bond movie marathons. We were doing these uh, uh, real reality TV shows now, not just game shows where we'd have play alongs in the reality TV show. Really amazing, cool stuff, very creative. We were just so passionate about it. But the world was literally collapsing. And at a certain point, uh, we, we had to move back into our houses. Like we literally couldn't keep our super plush offices. So we were like back where we started. Only this time we had millions and millions of dollars in debt. And the debt collectors were coming after us because everybody was going bankrupt and they were in bankruptcy and they were forced to collect their debt from us. And that was personal loans, right? I mean, you had personal guarantees on that debt. We were uh, smart enough not to have any personal guarantees. I wouldn't do that. Like I, I, I will take big risks, but I'm not going to risk... Uh, my, my own credit record, my own life savings. We had never, we had done everything without uh, personal guarantees. We had got big banks, to big venture banks to do all the financing. So that was good. But what we cared about was our company, like we, more than the, the, the money. We just wanted to keep our company alive. And we couldn't do that with millions and millions of dollars in debt when all, we had no revenue. Now coming in, <laughs> we're like struggling to just keep the servers going. They, um, what I ended up doing was a really tough choice. So I went to the big venture bank and they had hired this ex-Marine to kind of bully these startups into paying, like literally this ex-Marine, like the debt collector <laughs> um, for this big venture bank. And, you know, and, and I was like, look, I'll be honest with you. You know, we have no money. Like we, we can give you, our, you know, the office furniture, whatever you want. <laughs> like you take those computers, we don't need them, but we can't give you uh, any, any, um, cash, uh, the only thing we have is our intellectual property. And I go, if you let us off the hook for this debt so that we can just wind the company down gracefully, you know, and not have to go into bankruptcy, which is a huge nightmare in itself, then we will give you our intellectual property. And that's the deal I did. Now it was a painful, excruciating deal to make, um, but there was no other way out. And it was the best deal we could get. Like literally because we would not have gone bankrupt. We would just shut the company down and, and nobody would owe any money and we could move on. So we did that. And that ends that chapter of my life. <laughs> the whole dot com in a nutshell from the glory days to the, to the collapse I, I had to go through um, in this crazy world of interactive gaming and television. Okay. So, so Steve, this is what I want to do with the, with the time we have here. You told, you told us on the last show that you're an angel investor today, that you, you invest in, in companies and stuff. And you have this amazing sort of history navigating that world in the beginning. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious how much of that plays in today when you're looking to invest in a company. What are you doing if you're going to invest in a company? What, do, what is it that you want to see? I have to imagine you have empathy for all of these entrepreneurs how much of that empathy plays a role in, in, in how you conduct that business? I'm, I'm super interested in kind of that. These experiences that I had with both successes um, and failures, I've had both, plenty of both because I've tried so many different things. Uh, they have really fundamentally changed me. They have humbled me. So when I am with entrepreneurs and those entrepreneurs are really struggling, I do empathize with them. I know uh, in my heart the pain that they could be going through at any moment. I have experienced it. And I think it's made me a much better mentor and coach to entrepreneurs. It's made me a much better uh, person. And it's really uh, 
inspired me to launch Founderspace, which is our startup accelerator to work with entrepreneurs and development teams because we've, you know, I've personally been through a lot of this and um, I have a lot of experience to share from that. And also I can see through their eyes why they're making the decisions they made. And I also know um, how easy it is to make these mistakes, like us turning down that, that golden buyout offer uh, right before the market imploded, <laughs> but not being able to see that the market was about to implode. Um, those, those things just happen. And now as an investor, you know, luckily I didn't give up. So if, you, uh, anything, if you've taken anything away from this narrative, it's that I just keep going, right? And like, no matter what. So after that, that was just a minor setback. Uh, felt like a major one at the time, but in the scheme of things, it, it's, it's a minor one. And, and I just kept building from there. And today, you know, I work with startups, I coach them, we have uh, our venture fund, we invest in them, and I work with lots of venture capitalists all over the world now, selecting startups. And I can, and it helps me evaluate which startups are really there. You know, who's bullshitting, uh, who has, who can deliver on what they say, um, what, you know, what are their personalities like, uh, can they weather the storm? Because I always assume there will be storms and if they, if they can't weather them, then it, you know, at, certain, at that point it's gonna kill them. Um, and uh, that has made a big difference and it's, it's given me, I think, a competitive edge in the venture capital world uh, with tools to use to actually select entrepreneurs. Because I'll tell you, a lot of VCs out there, they graduate like Harvard Business School, uh, they get on the right track, and they've never really run a startup. They literally got in the, in the, in the, in the uh, old boys club and they, they just kind of rode, rode you know, the others' coattails up there, but they've never actually suffered. And so I think, I think suffering and going through these experiences is really important. Is Founder Space focused on a specific sector uh, um, of startup industry or it's a blended sort of, if you have the right idea and the right time, we're interested? My fundamental hypothesis of the way the world works is that technologies are always evolving. Technologies are always changing. So we are always open to the latest technology. Like we don't say uh, we are just an AI focused accelerator or we're just a blockchain focused accelerator. Yeah, I knew a lot of accelerators and funds out there that were just focused on VR, right? And they were too early. And what do you do when that technology doesn't pan out? You know, in the time frame you have for that fund, you're sunk. Uh, I know a lot of, uh, t you know, st uh, startup companies that had very narrow focuses um, venture firms, and it it's, it's, can be a win if that really takes off, but it can also be a real detriment. We wanted Founder Space to be a broader than that. So we are, tech, we are sector agnostic. So we work across all sectors. All we're looking for really are really groundbreaking ideas with uh, teams that can execute. Real, we don't fund teams where that aren't kind of developer driven. And by developer driven, I mean the core team has to be technology focused, has to have developers that are 100% committed. Like they are the stakeholders. They aren't contractors that were hired on. They aren't, you know, they, they aren't part-time people. These are people who are fully committed uh, to developing that technology. They're total geeks. They love what they do. And those are the people we want to fund. I've always felt like you invest in people not really in anything else that the people are is the ip at the end of the day it's the people that you're what, what are your thoughts on that is that way off is it where's your head on that kind of i've seen a lot of teams i've worked with hundreds of teams and i will tell you uh the teams a team can come to me with a brilliant idea but if that team isn't great like they're not the best development team. They're not, uh, they don't have all the right pieces in place. They don't have a really good designer. They don't have somebody who's a real hustler who can go out there and, you know, knock down doors to get the business done. If they don't have the right team in place, they will almost inevitably fumble the ball and somebody else will pick up that ball and run with it. Like the next person along will, will win, will end up winning. So when we invest, it is always the team because I've seen uh, teams come to me and they had a mediocre idea. Like it wasn't right, but, but that team was incredible. Like I knew uh, they, they had something. They were going to build something. They were going to figure it out. 
So even if they start on the right co uh, wrong course, uh, uh, you, they can course correct. A really good team will all of a sudden realize, wow, we're on the wrong course. They'll shift. They'll shift again. They'll shift again. And you know, I, so I always bet on the right teams. If you look at like Bill Gates, his first company didn't work out. If you look at Jack Ma and Alibaba, you know, he had t uh, two failed companies before he did Alibaba. And then even Alibaba struggled for years before they actually figured out how they were going to make money and do something. But that Jack Ma and Bill Gates, they are determined people. So I'm always looking at the people. Um, they have to be the right people. They have to kind of be focused in the right areas. I want them focused in areas that I know are growth areas, but they don't have to have the exact right idea at the beginning. I started my first company in 2004 and it failed by 2008. I was about, I'll just be honest with everybody, I was about $250,000 in debt with four young, five young kids, right? Thinking I, that this was gonna set me up for my children. Oh and in 2008, goodness. I'm going back to work for somebody barely paying, paying the bills with all of this debt. That's why you asked that question. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, is that when I started Arden about 11 years ago, I had about $10,000 left in the bank and we used it. And, and it's the second business that's, and we've been very, very focused with cash. Like we haven't taken anybody's money, right? Um, and so I think I've always felt like it's important that you realize that first business is probably going to fail because there's so much you have to learn that you almost, I almost want it to fail fast now. I, I, if I could have gone back, I wouldn't have waited to 2008. I would have maybe waited, you know, maybe you do it a little earlier. Um, let me, I want to ask you two more questions here. Uh, I, and I just brought that story up because everybody, I think, you hear so many, sometimes you just meet too many people that have had success and nobody talks about their failures. And I think, I think that's unfair for people looking to try to get into the, be an entrepreneur, right? Like I totally agree. That's why I try to mention my failures. Like I want people to understand that, you know, you, you will fail and it's okay to fail and you can get through it. Um, and, but a lot of people hide their failures. Nobody wants to talk about their failures. They just want to talk about all the great things they did. <laughs> So I want to ask a couple questions now. Um, I had always, I'm not in this VC space. I've never reached out to ask for money. Me and my business partner is always someone where we try to manage cash because money's expensive at that point, right? And not that we're averse to it, but I've never gone through, the, through that process. So, but I've always heard that VC companies have this kind of formula where they're going to invest in like 10 companies knowing you know, four are going to fail, hopefully four are successful and something's in the middle. How, how do you balance risk in all the investments you're making? Because you have to, do, do you have some calculation that not everybody I invest in is going to be successful? In most, any serious investor will tell you that the majority of their investments will not pan out. Either they will fail or they will deliver middling results that don't really move the dial and weren't worth the risk. A very few of those investments, like if you have a portfolio of, of, of 10 companies, you are lucky if you get one home run out of that. And that home run is typically called a fund maker. So it's one company like a Google, like a Facebook, like a Twitter, you name it. One company that just achieves incredible success and literally pays for all the other companies, pays for all the losses and all the, all the other companies, the other nine, even the ones that were semi-successful or considered successful, all of them added up together don't even come close to the value of that one fund maker. So as a venture firm, the whole model is built on a portfolio model, which means it's a hit driven business. It's like Hollywood. Like you have a blockbuster, it pays for all the loser films you made and all the, the low grossing films you made. So when, when, when you invest, you have to have that mentality. You have to have the mentality that you, there are too many unknowns. Like I said, you can pick a great team in a great market at a great time and something can come along and derail that company. Like one of the founders can get sick <laughs> or there can be a fight with the founders or the market can shift or a million different things can, you know, financial crisis like I ran into. Like there are just a million different things that can go wrong that can kill that company. So you've just got to expect uh, that you, what you're aiming for is every time you make an investment, 
in the venture capital world, you are trying to bet on that one company which will become your unicorn, your fund maker, the one that pays for all the, the other bad bets you made. And that model tends to work out pretty well if you're good at picking. And if you're really lucky, you get more than one. So then you're, you have this you know, golden fund where you're, or even if it's just one, if that, that company becomes a Google, you know, that's just, it's incredible, right? You, the, the return on investment is, is astronomical. So um, my philosophy is, uh, works along those lines. Um, I'm also uh, in my, I also, you know, fund, the people have their own styles of, of investing. So um, I tend to like companies with certain business models. So I really like companies uh, that make uh, products out there that are more than products. Uh, they are, I tend to gravitate towards platforms. Like if you can build a platform uh, where other people can join you in your ecosystem and actually create value and get value from that, extremely powerful. And if we look at all the biggest companies in the world today, almost uh, in technology, almost all of them have evolved into platforms. So they are platforms, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Google, you know, whether it's Microsoft, it doesn't matter. They tend, Apple, they tend to be platforms. So I tend to focus on platforms, although I will do products, um, if it's a very strong product in a product category. What I also like is not when you get a customer, you don't get one-time revenue from the customer. You don't get money just once but you get what's called recurring revenue. And that means that that customer keeps giving you money over their lifetime and they stick with you. This type of business model is golden in software. Like it is, uh, it's golden in anything. Like whether it's insurance, it doesn't matter what it is. Banking, if the, if you can, the customer can continually, you can continually make money off of that customer. That means that the, you could take the cost of acquiring the customer up front, and then you can look at the total lifetime value, and that is when you when the venture money really goes to work. Because what they're saying is we're going to advance you the money to acquire all these customers so that you can become market leader, and then we know you'll make us back because their lifetime value is going to exceed the cost of customer acquisition. That so that's what I'm looking for, and I'm looking for companies uh, with a business where they can lock in the customer and ideally where they get that network effect, where the more uh, partners and customers they bring on, the more value is created for everybody in the ecosystem. When you have that, as soon as that company becomes big, almost impossible to displace. Well, one of the things we are doing at Arden is we're talking to, um, we talk to engineers who are working on products today, a lot of them open source, and we're helping them build businesses around it because we have the business engine here, right? Even if we're not gonna do the engineering. And I, the first question I always ask myself when I'm looking at these products is, where is the revenue model? Not that I need a dollar today, but when do we see our first dollar? Then where, maybe where we can break even. But if I can't realize that there's even a dollar, that some human being isn't going to give me at least a dollar in some certain amount of time, I honestly, I'm not interested in it. I don't, users are not exciting to me. I'll put a million, I don't care about that. Who's going to give me that dollar? Right. And, and where is that going to come from? And then the other thing I'm always looking at, too, is can we have service contracts? Because that's what really helped a lot of companies in 2001. The companies that survived that I saw where they lost all their client revenue, they, you know, new, new sales, they survived on, on service contracts that were kind of locked in. Right. They couldn't go away. And so that's always stuck in my brain. So how important is it for you if somebody comes to you looking looking to you know be a part of founder space and 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 all this that there's a revenue model even if there's even if it's not solidified but there's some revenue model that we can see part of my job as a venture capital is capitalist is to be able to imagine what revenue models could be possible even at the very early stage of a company when they have no revenue so uh, for me it, if i am in a position where i can't see into the future that this company will ever make money i you know to me the model's broken i won't invest like it's just it's a no-go and uh, there are companies out there which will tell me oh we're going to use an ad model to make money and i'm like great how long do users stick with your application 
Well, they only come once in a while. Like they may come a couple times a year. What are you talking about an ad model? Like you're never gonna get an ad model. Like an ad model requires them to come like every day <laughs> into your application and use it. Um, th that's like fundamental to having an ad model and you have to scale to millions of users. If you can't meet those two criteria, ad model doesn't work. Like, so I will try to match the revenue model with the product. Like what does the product do? What value does it give? Are people gonna pay for it? So you aren't, can't use an ad model for that type of product that people use a couple times a year, even if it's super valuable, you have to be able to charge them. Now, will people pay for this? Well, that depends on how much value they see in it. So you have to be able, they have to be able to show me that they are creating enough value with that product to get people to actually buy a subscription or pay whenever they come, whatever it is, and that they can scale this to uh, millions of users. If they can't do that, then again, uh, the model doesn't work. One of the failures that I took away from that first business, and we were, we were basically putting real estate listings on maps before Google on the internet. We were doing home evaluations before Zillow. Wow. <laughs> and Zillow was all over our site six months before they launched. Really? Right? <laughs> Zillow's still here and we are not. Oh, painful. I, I, I learned a lot. But one of the things I learned was that we had never really gotten out of Florida in terms of real estate listings and home evaluations in those first three years. And there were little companies like Redfin popping up where they would concentrate on a small little city in multiple states and overnight they became a national company. And we never became the national company. And what I try to tell people today is you have to be a global company day one. If you're not, you're not in the game. You know, and it, these are other things I'm looking at too when I talk to people. What are your thoughts on, on that? I always look for entrepreneurs who have an outsized vision. So a vision that yes, we aren't gonna be some small local company. We may start local, but as quickly as possible, we are gonna take what we learn in our local market and start expanding. Like even before it's prudent, because if you don't expand, there's gonna be somebody else who is expanding. And this is why venture capital is so important. Because in a winner take all market like we live in, in tech, like most of it is winner take all. The one, the one company that gains dominance, uh, they become harder and harder to displace. You know, without, if you don't have something that's really exponentially better than them or very different, you aren't even gonna be able to compete at all. So uh, as soon as somebody gets it right um, and, and then they're moving, they have momentum, they have the money, you know, it's game over usually, unless they totally screw up. So at the very beginning, it's really important that you move fast and bit and think big. And this is why uh, geography still matters. I mean, we can be all over the world, but you gotta have access to capital. And the funny thing is, I don't know what, Florida may be much better now, but at a, you know, way back when, there wasn't a lot of venture capital floating around Florida compared to let's say New York or Silicon Valley. And then the unique thing about Silicon Valley is especially historically, it's, it's been changing now. There are places like Austin and, and up in Seattle and lots of uh, hubs with more and more capital. But historically, Silicon Valley capital was very different from everywhere else. You know, there was one money center and that was New York for the United States for big high financing. But Silicon Valley evolved into a separate being and that they were willing to take much bigger risks. They weren't conservative like New York. They didn't, New York was still rooted in the, in the old way of thinking. It's changed now, but this is, you know, historically. Now, Silicon Valley investors are willing to take bets, big bets on unproven ideas if they had a big vision. And I think um, with a lot of startups, unless you can get in that flow, you can access the capital and you can access the talent that really pushes and knows how to scale a business. Uh, you can miss a great opportunity, like by no fault of your own. Like technically, you could have delivered everything, but you know there are another competitor out there, like you know Redfin or Zillow, that that gets you know gets it right, gets all the capital, gets all the support, and boom, they take the market. And they make the right decisions. They 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 move in the right like, and I'm sure that wasn't their first rodeo, where this was our first rodeo, right? And so, you have to learn these things, and and. We were in Miami, we were, we were definitely isolated. It would have been nice to have friends and partners, you know, be able to navigate that. L let me ask you this. I meet a lot of engineers who want to build product, but they don't want to run their own business. They just want to do the engineering, which is sometimes where we come in because we're like, we have sales and marketing, and we have accounting and we do all that. 
when you talk about a team coming in to that you're going to invest in, are you talking about teams that are beyond just engineers? Are you looking for somebody that has the accounting person and the sales and marketing people already? Or is that something that you can provide when the time is right? As an investor, I don't care whether the team has an in-house marketing and accounting people. In fact, I don't really want them to <laughs> at an early stage. It's like not a good use of their, the core, the core uh, founder's equity to, to be, you know, to have a partner who just does accounting <laughs> and, and all this uh, administrative work. That's not what the value of the company is. They should be outsourcing that. Uh, at the beginning and later, uh, you know, if they get big enough to, to justify it, they can hire some full-time people to take over those roles internally in the company. But at the early stage, I tell them, like all I look for is do they have an amazing technical team? Do they have an, a really good visionary designer that understands user experience? And do they have somebody who will go out there and get the business done, get deals done? That's what I look for. Everything else, like marketing, you don't even have money at the beginning to spend a lot on marketing. You shouldn't have your own in-house marketing person. Like, that's, you're paying a huge amount of money when they can't even do much because, the, the, you know, you should be outsourcing that. Accounting, uh, HR, all those other things, those should all be outsourced. Because when, when you brought something up that just triggered another lesson that I learned. When my first company failed, that company's called Home Keys, by the way. I don't know. I don't know if you're <laughs> Historically, that's great. Home Good Keys. Name. Historically, it's called Home Keys. When Home Keys failed, I had to go work for a company that was gaming. We were building. We were told to build a lottery system for the Dominican Republic because people loved lottery there, and it was privatized, and they can buy lottery tickets on their phone using text messages. Nobody really did research there. Everybody wanted a piece of paper in their hand. But the the the, the point of this story was we had a product. It was amazing. It could have been used in any place on the planet that had private lottery. But the, the person that was running the company didn't want to go out and do the business development, didn't want to go out and sell it, didn't want to, had the resources, had, could have done it. This product could have been every. We could have gone to Vegas and said, look, you know, this is all going to open up. I mean, we're talking, you know, at this point, 2009, 10. We were told, go to Vegas, start talking to somebody out there. We've got the platform. Wouldn't do that work. And so now all this tech you build just falls apart. And so I, I think it's interesting that you're, you're saying that this team should have somebody who's going to hit the road or make the phone calls and, and, and find, like you did, like your, your whole story from the last podcast into here, going out there and being present and talking to people and trying to drum up interest in what you're doing. Technology is never just enough. You can have the best technology in the world, but it's just technology. It's not a business. Unless you get it into customers' hands, they find value in it, they use it, and they ultimately pay you, reward you for developing it. So yeah, I meet a lot of startups that are very focused on the tech. And I think technology is, is what technology is, is it opens up doors. So new technology, new ways of doing things, uh, being able to create value where there wasn't value before, that opens a door of opportunity, but it's only a door. You need somebody to go through that door and actually <laughs> connect that technology and, and the product with the customer and make it into a business. And that's what really an entrepreneur does. So an entrepreneur, a technologist builds great technology. So I love to see the technologist pair with the entrepreneur because uh, the technologist is basically opening the door for the entrepreneur to actually go through and create a whole new business. That, that combination is right. And if you're missing either one of those, honestly, you know, it's usually not gonna work. Technology people, you know, in the communities that I'm living and breathing in, there are these amazing engineers and they have these ideas and they want these products and they wanna build a business, right? But they're just the technology people. And so what I'm kind of hearing from you and is that if they were to come to you, you really wouldn't be able to work with them because they need to build a bit, little bit of a larger team to have that sort of sales and marketing person there with them as well with the tech. Forget about everything that we can outsource, but nobody can really come to you and, unless they're able to f even fulfill that because you're not going to do that for them. That's not what you're there for. A startup accelerator is not there to do... Uh, the core work. 
that core work always has to be done by the startup. Whether, whatever it is, like if you need to build technology, if you need to do business development, if you need to get your uh, insurance filed, if <laughs> your accounting done, that's the responsibility of the startup. The accelerator is really there uh, to help guide uh, the entrepreneur to the next level. So all, every startup you know, has problems. Every startup you know, has limited, most of them, especially the ones joining accelerators, they, they haven't done this before. So they don't know what they don't know. So, but we do, we've been there, right? We've been in the trenches. We also have a lot of relationships. So we can come in there and we can say, look, you should be talking to this person. Like they're going, uh, this person will really help you solve that problem you need. Or you, if you wanna get into do business with Samsung, we know the people to talk to. Or if you need to raise money, this is the right venture capitalist. That is what startup accelerators do best. And then we analyze their business plan, we analyze their business model, we let them know if we've seen this like a dozen times before and it's failed, what are they gonna do different? Like, do they have ideas that they can do something that all these other startups didn't? Do they, is there technology that they have that can make this work when it didn't work before? Those are the type of hard questions we pose to entrepreneurs. I'm so glad that I'm talking to you about some of this stuff because I know our listeners are thinking about these things all the time. Miami's trying to become the next Silicon Valley. They're promoting this like there's no tomorrow. And th there's blog post after blog post about this funding and that funding. And I've been really down on Miami, even though I live here. Because early on, 10 years ago, when I was trying to c get involved in this city and I had my startup, nobody wanted to talk to me because I wasn't going to be a product company as much as I was trying to be out there helping other companies develop product, helping other companies success, training and all this stuff. Nobody wanted to talk to me because I wasn't willing to just take $25,000 and sleep on a couch. Like, no, I'm, I'm 40 years old at this point. Like, I can't do that, right? And we're looking to build product all the time. We're looking to help others who are building product with that part of it that we've been talking about. But if a company like mine is established for 10 years, we've got a product, we're really happy with it, we're looking now for extra investment. Are the accelerators or the VCs interested in companies like mine that are established 10 years that are, that are now looking to, to maybe raise money? Or is this industry that you're in really looking for younger people who are just starting out and need that boost? Like, I'm always curious about this because I have felt like I've always been pushed back because we're 10 years old. In my book, Surviving a Startup, I actually write about this. So I write about two things. One is ageism. You know, are, you know there's this myth out there that younger entrepreneurs are much more successful than older entrepreneurs. So if you're in your 20s, you're gonna be much more successful than if you're in your 50s. So that's what uh, a lot of Silicon Valley believes. That's what a lot of the world believes. But actually, if you look at the statistics, those numbers are not true. <laughs> they are, it's actually not, it's actually the reverse. Uh, people with more experience under their belt, which kind of makes sense, are actually have a higher chance of being successful with their companies. So older entrepreneurs, they might, not, uh, they might not have the energy, but a lot of old people do have a lot of energy, but they might not have the energy of somebody in their 20s, but they far make up for that in their knowledge, experience, relationships, and other areas, skill sets. So um, older entrepreneurs tend to be more successful. The thing is though, there are far fewer older entrepreneurs. So most people, by the time they're you know, in their 40s or 50s, they are kind of set and they're not willing to put in that extra work to be an entrepreneur. So they're not starting as many companies, whereas a lot of people in their 20s, like they have nothing to lose. They're out there starting companies. So we see a lot more successful companies run by young people simply because there's so many more young people trying and failing. Like they fail a lot more, they try a lot more, and they get more successes just by sheer numbers not by statistical, stati statistically being better. And then there's another thing. If a company has been around a long time um, and hasn't moved the dial, nothing has happened, this is an area where venture capitalists uh, tend to shy away from. So they want companies that are starting out of the gate fresh. Um, and the reason is because there's an assumption there 
that if a company hasn't isn't showing a lot of traction after uh, years and years of trying this, that there's something missing, that that company isn't a good bet. They want a, to see a company come out of the gate with a new idea, new technology, new market uh, that, you know, and then they want to see that there's a pent up demand for this product. It's the right thing at the right time. Boom. That's the, that's the sweet spot. Now, this isn't to say a company that's been around a while can't come up with something new and then uh, uh, discover a market and, and, and have it take off. The, the thing is, it has to be new because if it's been around 10 years and it's still doing the same thing that it did 10 years ago and it hasn't scaled in a big way, there isn't a lot of traction, then somebody else would have already probably figured it out. Like there, there's so many entrepreneurs out there trying so many things that some, somebody else would have probably figured it out. And the odds are that this hasn't remained a secret for the past decade. Like it, it hasn't, you know, that, that, there, that there's a reason it isn't growing like crazy. That not, not that this team couldn't have done it a decade ago, but that fact that nobody did it for the past decade and became the dominant player means that it's probably what they're doing uh, isn't creating that much more value than uh, to justify hyper growth, which is really what VCs are looking for. They're not looking for a good business. They're not looking for a great business. They're looking for a, a moonshot business, right? We are looking for business with parabolic curves like that. Go, those are the ones venture want to fund. They want to fund that fund maker. So they want to fund the company that becomes the next Google. They don't want to fund just a steadily growing business. That's not what VCs do. So if, it's, if you can go to a VC and you can prove you're a steadily growing business, you're doing fine, you're making money, you're profitable, they don't care. Because the fact is their business model is predicated on investing a lot of money. Like a lot of these funds, the later stage funds, they'll have 500 million, a billion dollars in the fund. That means within a three year period, these funds have a life of like 10 to 12 years, but within a three year period, they have to shovel in hundreds of millions of dollars. So they gotta pick these companies that are gonna grow like crazy. That's the job of a VC. So when you are looking at, uh, when you're a VC and you're looking at companies, if you've seen one that it hasn't gone anywhere, the, the, I tell entrepreneurs, look, if you've been doing the same thing for 10 years and it hasn't taken off and nobody else has taken off in this space, it's not going to take off. It is what it is. However, if you come up with a new idea in those 10 years, a new way of doing something, you have some new technology that unlocks value that hasn't been tapped. At that point, spin it off. Start something new. Just call it a new name. Put it out there. Put your team on it. Don't, don't have your legacy company dragging you down because they're just going to use that as a filter to say no, right? So spin it off as a new thing. Say, we just started this, blah, blah, blah. We figured this out and then go for it and see if you can get funding. That's the smartest way. That's brilliant advice. I know five years into this company, we had two years of no growth of revenue. My business partner is really good. And he's like, Bill, this isn't going to work. If our revenue isn't growing every year, we, we've got problems. And so we doubled down and made a big investment in people. And then we've had growth again ever since. But we are constantly always looking at growth. And I am constantly always looking at, well, let's pretend all this business died because nobody wants it anymore. What is everybody going to want tomorrow? And I'm trying yes. to stay three. I'm, I'm really trying to stay three to six months ahead of what I think is going to be, even if I don't believe in it a little bit, <laughs> I've got to learn it because if I don't, then we're done, right? And I'm always doing that. But I love the idea that if we decided here at Arden that we wanted to really build something new to really detach it from the old business so we don't have that baggage that you've talked about, which I never realized was baggage. Yeah, then it is baggage and it will hurt you. So then you just jettison that, launch a new company, you know, uh, and, and go for it. Really focused on whatever that thing is that you figure out will really drive the growth. Brilliant. All right, we've got like five minutes left here. So what I wanna do for the last five minutes is if someone is interested in coming to, to you, you know, founder, uh, founder space with ideas after listening to this, uh, what is the best thing they can do to prepare themselves to even make this introduction? What, what should they have in place so they're not burning burning this territory, right? That's what I always say. Be prepared because once you burn it, 
it, it's gone. So what, what's your recommendation for anybody coming, uh, approaching Founderspace, approaching you with ideas? How should they be prepared? At Founderspace, uh, we get a lot of business plans, like a huge number. I can't read them all. They're just too many. So we have our team uh, working, you know, reviewing those. And then we just, we tend to pick the very best ones. Like, why wouldn't you? You know, the top few percent of the business plans coming in. A, a lot of them, you know, they just aren't ready. Some of them are awful. Some of them are pretty good, but they're not in our uh, sweet spot. So, or we just don't see the potential and it's hard. But what we tell uh, development teams out there and entrepreneurs is look, first thing we want is a really great development team. Like <laughs> you have to have really uh, good techies on your team. Number two, uh, you need to have figured out something that nobody else has figured out, something really valuable. Like, is there a pocket of value out there that, that is that, that the demand for what you have that is untapped, that nobody else is tapping, and you have figured out a way to give it to them using your technology, using your whatever you built. And then number three, I want the full team in place. I want the technologist. I want to see a great designer. I want to see a great business person all together on that team to really drive it. And then they need to create an investor deck. And an investor deck can be pretty simple. And uh, there, it's, if you go to Founderspace, we have sample investor decks there, founderspace.com. But it's usually 10 slides, 12 slides, 15 slides, PowerPoint slides, not more than 20 PowerPoint slides, please. <laughs> like keep it concise. And really not a lot of words a lot of visuals and, and key concepts on each slide, one key concept. You know, uh, what is your product? Who is your customer? What value do they see? What traction have you had? What demonstration of demand can you prove to us is out there? And who is the team? What are your backgrounds? Those things in an investor deck in PowerPoint slides, you just send it to the investor. Also, another thing that not too many startups do, but they should do more of, Create a short video, a two minute video, explaining your product, visually showing us what you're building. You speaking to the camera so we can see you. Invest, you know, when investors, venture capitalists, all of them get bombarded with business plans. But if we see a link to a video that we can click on, sit back and watch, everybody's lazy. Like if you can feed it to us, feed it to us. Like get on there and talk to us in your voice about your vision, about your product and show us what it does that um, though and have some of your potential customers talk about it right give testimonials to what you have and the value it creates for them those things oh, those those are the the things that will get you in the door that will get you in the door and then once you're in the door once we're in a conversation then we go deep and that's the next level so this brought up a couple things and we, we, we don't have a lot of time left in this but I, I want to ask this question should I file patents before I send you all this stuff? Like, how worried do I have to be with my intellectual property when I'm sending you and others um, all of this material on the ideas and the things we're building? Do I need to protect myself first? First of all, most venture capitalists will not sign NDAs. So they just don't do it because they're looking at, they're getting too many business plans. They're getting more business plans than they can even read. So, you know, there may be a conflict between two companies that they don't even know about, right? And they don't want to be sued for like saying that they shared information from one to another when they didn't, just because those two companies happened to send them business plans or they talked to them. So basically they're not going to sign an NDA. Um, so if you have technology that is really valuable, I mean, don't send your source code. In fact, the investors don't want to see your source code. Your idea, you can't really protect your idea. The best way to protect your idea is by moving fast. The best way to move fast is to go out there, build your product, get customers and get capital. Like that's, and in order to do that, you have to expose your idea to the world. You're never going to get off first base, even to second base, if you don't start showing your product to customers, if you if you aren't showing your product to investors, you, you have to show it to them. You can't expect them all to sign NDAs. This doesn't mean go to a big conference where all your competitors are and announce what you're doing. Don't do that. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying the chance of a venture capitalist, which has a job to fund companies, actually stealing your product is very, very low. 
You know, most of us don't. If it's great, we'll invest in it. If it's not, we don't. We're on to the next thing. Like we don't have a big investment in this thing. We're not going to quit our job and try to steal your company. And we're not going to jeopardize our reputation by sending it to somebody else. That said, if you're worried, when you before you uh, email your idea to the venture capitalists, ask them, uh, summarize it, and say, do you have anything similar to this? Right? Or look, a lot of times our portfolios are listed. Is there another company in your portfolio that's doing the same thing? If you can see that on their website, just skip that venture capitalist. Or ask them, and they, they'll usually say, no, we don't have anything similar, or yes, we have something very similar. Um, and then you can decide whether it's worth sharing your business with them. But at the end of the day, don't worry about it. Like the chance of you failing because some venture capitalist or potential customer steals your idea is this big. It's tiny, little teeny tiny. The chance of you failing because you don't go out aggressively enough, show it to more people than you ever thought possible. Um, if you don't do that, your chance of failing is huge, right? That uh, going out, uh, staying in your own little bubble, you will fail. You will fail almost 100%. You will not create a business. You need to put your product into the world. And remember, as soon as you put your product into the world, as soon as TechCrunch or some uh, you know, Wall Street Journal writes about you, everybody in the world will know about it. As soon as you put it up on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, everybody in the world will know about it. So what are you hiding? You're not protecting anything. Steve, it has been so much fun to talk to you. And I don't want to end this conversation, but I, I, I want to ask this last thing before we, or two more, well, last thing, and then you can let everybody know how they can reach out to you or, or if they have questions and things. But I've had so much fun talking to you. You've had all these stories, and I had to cut some of your stories off so we could have this conversation. But I, I can't imagine that your personality is not in the books. So just briefly tell everybody some of the books that you've written. You ha you've got a new one that's out, what they are, and, and it's just a quick kind of summary of what we would get from these these books that you've written. Because... If they're anything like the stories that you've told already, I'm about to buy them once I hang up this uh, this, <laughs> this phone call because I want to hear them. Do you have stories in these books too? Uh, just, just quickly talk about your book. Thank you so much. My uh, books are written in the same tone that I talk in. So they are very uh, passionate, full of excitement, full of stories from all these entrepreneurs out there that I've worked with, that I've known. Um, and full of advice, like they are packed like with advice. So I wanted to give something that I wanted to read, which means something that I f would find, you know, every page, is, these aren't just one idea, big idea books. These are I books like crammed with hundreds of ideas. So my fir first book was actually Game Design Workshop. I was a game designer. Uh, that was published by CMP years ago. It's um, it's out there. There's a new reprint. I wasn't involved in the second and third editions, but that's out there. It's a good book. Um, the books about business I have are Make Elephants Fly, which is all about the process of innovating. Like, how do you come up with that big idea, realize it, and bring it to market? And that was published by Hachette. You just go to founderspace.com, you'll see it, or Amazon, Make Elephants Fly. And then my new book that we just launched, Surviving a Startup which is really about what we've been talking about, everything about how startups, everything they need to do to survive and hopefully eventually thrive, like grow into those big companies. And uh, again, um, that was published by HarperCollins. It's on Amazon and on Founderspace. All right, so now I'm gonna be Chuck. Hoffman, Hoffman, tell everybody how they can get in touch with you, Hoffman, if they have questions or need to know more. Okay, Chuck, <laughs> I will tell you. So uh, I'm on every social network and all you do is search for Founderspace or you come to the website, founderspace.com and click on the contact form. You can contact me all those ways. I'm there um, and I would love to hear from you. So we have a whole section on our site for business plans to submit plans, to join our incubator. Everything's up there. This is brilliant, Steve. I, I am so blessed to have met you. When the uh, email came in for us to talk, I was a little hesitant because I haven't talked to anybody kind of outside of my little world yet. And this has been just an amazing experience. So I just, and you came back twice. So thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. All right. So this is Bill Kennedy with the On Labs podcast. Thank you for spending time with Steve and I and listening to Steve's amazing story.